Congress tosses some scraps to Americans struggling through the pandemic. Will $600 do it for you? Colorado's lessons learned from week one of vaccinations as we go into week two of shots. A Republican leader at the Capitol retaliates against a reporter for a story he didn't like by publishing the journalist's home address. A Colorado creates a movement for isolated artists who don't have their usual subjects these days. And we've tallied up the tip you put together for out-of-work restaurant workers. It's huge because you're awesome and because this is next. Coloradans, all Americans need quick, decisive action from Congress to get through the financial hardships of the pandemic. Instead, what you got was that Congress argued and installed and politicked for months. And now tonight, they're about to approve sending you a $600 check. Suppose we're supposed to be grateful for that. The $900 billion pandemic relief package is attached to a government funding plan. So, as you'll note, things got urgent when the government was about to run out of money, not when you were. The deal includes $600 stimulus payments to most Americans. There's also a new round of subsidies for businesses, money for schools and health care providers, and $25 billion in rental assistance. This also would extend the federal eviction moratorium through January 31st. And that's especially important in Colorado because our state's freeze on evictions has just been mirroring the national one. You know, so much about the pandemic has kind of been learn as you go. As Colorado prepares for a second week now of putting shots in arms, now with a second vaccine involved in the process, our Steve Steger asked healthcare leaders what they have learned from week one that will guide them in week two and beyond just an honor for me to be a part of that and, and just so exciting. And that energy is just, um, I'll never forget that first day at clinic. The preparation for that moment took months, but with so little known in the weeks leading up to it, a lot of the preparation took place in a matter of days. I just thought, oh, well, I'll get this shipment and unpack it and put it in my freezer. Ganesh Chandran runs the kind of inpatient pharmacy at University of Colorado Hospital. He says when the emergency authorization was approved for Pfizer's shot, they learned more about how they'd have to handle it. You have three minutes to get them into your ultra low freezer. So we had these like speed trials sort of to, to get this drug in there. I guess we had sort of planned for it, but I didn't realize how daunting it would be. You can actually see them set the clock in this video from when the vaccine initially arrived. And by now, you know, the vials, which Pfizer initially said only held five doses, actually held more which caused another unexpected scramble. Working with our team to figure out, okay, we need extra needles, we need extra alcohol swabs, we need extra syringes, we need extra um, the little vaccination cards you get when you get the vaccine, like for your wallet. In a different part of the state, Gunnison Public Health Director Joni Reynolds says one of the unexpected hurdles for her was paperwork. Normal vaccines only have a couple of pages. But in this document, 12 pages of information, much denser, much more challenging for individuals to read through and process and ask questions. And while she expected a little pomp and circumstance, the individual staff persons and the individuals um, that came in that were like, I want a picture that I didn't expect as much. Reynolds in Gunnison County also told me she was surprised with the amount of feedback from the community. Her office was just flooded with calls from people asking when they can be vaccinated. Another reminder on that right now is phase one, which is just healthcare workers and folks who live in long-term care. In the spring, they expect to be able to start phase two, which includes essential workers and people who are really at risk if they were to contract COVID-19, Kyle. And, you know, Steve, I think so many people want to know, well, when it gets to be my turn, how's it going to work or how might it work at my workplace or whatever else? And, and the answer is for, for phase two and beyond, a lot of that is being figured out kind of as we go. There might not be set plans. Yeah. And, you know, they've been working on these plans for healthcare facilities for months. But like I said, a lot of things weren't known in the lead up to this. So some of the, these things they've had to figure out in the couple days before they got the shot between the approval and when they got the vaccine doses. And so you imagine a lot of other organizations are going through a process right now, kind of watching what's happening at higher levels, trying to figure out how in the heck are we going to do this? Precisely as you were saying, lessons learned from week one, on to week two, on to week three from there. Uh, it is sweater weather today. Thank you, Steve, for getting in the spirit. 
Colorado's COVID hospitalizations keep falling from their all-time high. So while they're still high, they're not as high as they were. 1,253 patients at this point. That is down more than 200 people from this time last week. Our positivity rate also continues to move in the right direction. Current rate is now 7.2%, seven-day average, 7.4%. We were at 9.7% a week ago, so we're, we're headed there. Under five is what the public health experts would like to see. Our daily new case count, that's also dropping. Colorado added 1,858 new cases yesterday. That brings our seven-day average of new cases to a bit over 2,500 a day. And love the way that's moving, down about 1,000 cases a day from last week. So one in four Coloradans has downloaded that exposure notification app for contact tracing. I have it on my phone. More than a million Coloradans have signed up for this. Based on that number, the state is offering a number in terms of how many positive cases it thinks might have been prevented. Marshall Zellinger is in the business of questioning numbers that people, especially the government, puts out there. Marshall, they think that this app, million people signed up, has prevented 168,000 cases. How'd they get there? It's a statistic that had me wondering as well. In a recent presentation to the state legislature, Kyle, uh, the top COVID-19 response leaders updated the status of Colorado's exposure notifications app. It's the app that if both my phone and your phone have it and we're near each other long enough, they swap anonymous tokens. And if one of us tests positive for COVID-19 and tells the app about our positive tests, it will alert the last two weeks worth of tokens and this phone will get an alert that someone you were around long enough in the last two weeks just tested positive for COVID-19. Now that you know how it works, the state's COVID-19 leaders say 1.4 million have downloaded the app through last week. That's almost one quarter of the state's population. But when you test positive, the state gives you a code to put into the app to then alert the other phones. That's happened 12,800 times. Right now, that's the extent of the data the state has. It does not know how many other phones were alerted based on those 12,800 notifications. But the state believes the app itself has prevented 168,000 positive COVID-19 cases because a study from the University of Arizona says an app like this can prevent 12% of cases. And that's 12% of the people who have downloaded the app. But here is the asterisk. It depends on the degree to which notified contacts self-quarantine as directed, seek testing, or at least modify their behaviors to reduce onward transmission. Well, how does the state know that's happening? We see, based upon the testing numbers we have in Colorado, our present positivity, the feedback we get from our case investigation and contact tracing calls, that Coloradans are doing an exceptional job of all of those pieces. We don't have any evidence to suggest that people who enable the service and then use it to notify other people that those other people aren't taking the, the most rigorous precautions. There's a piece of the data that the state does not have access to all and hopes that's changing soon. That's how many people are notified when someone uploads a positive test. As I said, the state knows 12,000 people have uploaded a positive test to the app. The state doesn't know or have access yet to the data of how many people got alerted as a result of those 12,000, Kyle. Marshall, I know that we and others were skeptical when this first rolled out, but when you really get into the guts of the thing, it's not going to alert Jared Polis that you're drinking inside in the brewery so he can pop his head in. The way they do these tokens, it really does kind of put, put a veil of separation there. And it requires the user to do something. So when the state notifies you about your positive test, they give you this, this code. You have to go into the app and do it yourself. Otherwise, it's useless. You may have it on your phone, but if you don't utilize it with, when you have a positive test, the other people who you've been around will never find out. So it still has some user error to it if you don't follow through yourself. Yeah, user error slash personal responsibility. Marshall Zellinger, who also received the sweater memo. Thank you, sir. Governor Jared Polis has flexed significant powers during this pandemic with the legislature out of session. And today we learn Polis' fellow Democrats are going to let him continue to run the show for weeks longer by basically postponing the 2021 legislative session. Now, they're going to come back to swear in new members on January 13th. But then the Democrats who control both sides are going to recess immediately with the plan to come back February 16th. They said that they hope that the pandemic will have subsided by then. Republicans at the Capitol would love to limit the governor's power during this and future pandemics, but the fact is they don't have the votes to do anything without some Democrats' support.
Outgoing House Republican leader Patrick Neville is defending his decision to publish the home address of a journalist who wrote about how Neville funneled campaign money to his family's business. Neville doxed a Denver Post reporter on social media, then removed that home address after people pointed out that's not a smart idea. Neville told me today, the information's public. Incoming House Republican leader Hugh McKean told me he has not been determined if Neville's going to be sanctioned for his behavior. McKean said, quote, the release of a journalist's private information in retaliation for an unflattering story is wrong. McKean also said, quote, this type of reprisal is not acceptable, does not represent the values we, as Republicans, hold. Here's what I think. I think you should totally read the Denver Post story that was so dead on that Representative Neville posted the home address of the reporter who wrote it. Read the story. There's a link on the next Facebook page. So since the middle of last week, we all have been crowdfunding a tip for Colorado's out of work restaurant workers. $5 here, $10 here. It all adds up. And then the nonprofit Angel Relief Fund is going to distribute it to restaurant workers who have been laid off or furloughed. Next viewers have put together a tip totaling $94,755. That is amazing. That is money at the holidays that is going to go to your neighbors to pay their mortgage or their bills just to get by until restaurants reopen a bit more. You helped to drop a $94,000 tip on the table for restaurant workers who are struggling. In the last six months, Next Viewers have raised $2.2 million, one nonprofit a week, $5 or more at a time. I'm going to be back on Wednesday with a new idea of how I think that we can do some good twice over. We tried to live life as we could, as long as we could. He's convinced they would have had longer, if not for COVID, even though that's not what took her life. Artists in isolation find they always have one subject hanging around, staring them right in the mirror. A realization here at home becomes a worldwide movement. Next. There are deaths from COVID-19, and then there are the deaths indirectly caused because of how the pandemic has changed our world for the worse. Alzheimer's researchers say that the disease, deaths from it, are up nearly 17% above average during the pandemic, up more than 20% here in Colorado. Our Nelson Garcia looks at the cost of social isolation and lives. In a neighborhood of new construction in Monument sits a brand new home built on a foundation of love. She was a listener, uh, but she also had a very infectious laugh. Randy Rush's wife, Tammy, started having problems with her mind in 2010. It was actually difficult to figure out what was going on, but she was 49 at the time. 49 and eventually diagnosed with Alzheimer's. In Tammy's case, there was no family history. There was no other health issues of any kind. For years, Randy learned to live a new norm, taking care of his wife and buying a home in a retirement village, Mackenzie Place, to be near her as she moved into memory care. Daily seeing her, uh, a connection with her every day, uh, even to the point where even though she was in a memory care unit, we had a date night. Every Sunday night, we went out in various places for pizza. Though he was just hundreds of yards away, Randy could not see his wife, a matter that got even more complicated when he got COVID. It led to the fear that I would not be able to see or touch Tammy again. For five and a half months, the only contact Randy had was a few minutes through a glass door, fleeting chances to make her smile. She wasn't getting this kind of... Uh opportunity to react or to feel presence of people who love her. All he could do was watch through a window, watch Tammy dying from Alzheimer's. I can't describe the devastation and how difficult it was for her and for me both. He decided to move Tammy to Jackson Creek Senior Living in Monument, where he was finally allowed to visit her with proper safety protocols. I was just blessed. I don't know how else to describe it because all the feelings and the ability to be with her again flooded back and my love for her and I think hers for me just came together. So he moved into this newly built house. That's literally why we're sitting here. Just two minutes away. So he could spend her final two months by her side before her death in November. I got the decorations out. I put the lights up outside. It's for Tammy. And uh, Christmas was big. 
Brandy believes he would have had more time if COVID didn't keep him away. There is no cure for Alzheimer's. It's going to happen, uh, but I think it hastened it and made it go faster. Now he's writing a book about his experience. Even amid the late stage of her illness, I recognize glimpses of her calm and steadfast loving <laughs> A book built on a foundation of love. Well, the title of it is Loving Tammy, No Regrets, and it's how Tammy and I got through all of this and loved each other to the end. And Monument, Nelson Garcia, 9 News. Pretty, pretty remarkable husband. Uh, Randy says that he wants to write his book so that people will learn about and uh, better understand the impacts of social isolation. When you're kind of as isolated as we had all become, I was my only subject matter, and so I kind of just embraced that. An artist finds herself doubling as her subject because there weren't a lot of other people around. The ideas caught on, sparking a worldwide effort. That's next. For creative types, finding inspiration during isolation can be hard. One artist told us she searched for it while living with her husband and dogs during the pandemic. Then she found the perfect project for an artist cooped up at home, self-portrait. Aaron Herbst shows us what happened next. So this is um, a new mask that I'm working on. Alone time. It's something a lot of us have had to get used to. And there was a lot of, of fear, of frustration. Um, of sadness and loneliness. Adrian Delo has felt all of those things this year too. I struggled for a little while thinking about how can I artistically express what's going on with how I'm feeling with the pandemic. Before COVID-19. Yeah, so this is what I do normally. Her art looked different. My work has always been about the environment and bringing awareness to the ways that humans are, are changing things. And then 2020 happened. <laughs> And I found that expression in self-portraiture, and that has been really quite inspiring. I don't think I've done a self-portrait since college, which was many years ago. <laughs> and when Adrian really looked at herself, she realized this might help others too. Started inviting people to contribute work, and within the first uh, two weeks of the project, it had gone international. And everyone just wanted to share, and I think they wanted to show this this time of vulnerability and um, and fear and just feeling alone. Uh, several pieces from India. This one is from India. This one. She calls the project Pandemic Self Portraits. The Instagram page has over 600 contributors at this point. People, you know, people have reached out and told me that this project has helped them feel less alone during this time, which has been humbling and amazing and just beautiful. In a year that's been a lot of things, Adrian will remember it as a time when being alone brought the connection people were craving. This project just really lifted me up in a, in a time that was that was kind of hard. For next, this is Ann Herbst. Adrian's putting together a, a book of those self-portraits. If you have a creative one for her, get it on her Instagram page before the end of the year, and she'll consider including it. Your feedback about what's missing around here, next. We finish tonight with your feedback. Francis writes in, hey guys, what is with the lack of Christmas or holiday decorations on your set? Well, my set is my home and, and most of the holiday direct, uh, decorations are upstairs, but is this better, Francis? We just do the show like this every night. I'll just, I'll cradle it in my lap. I kind of like it. This is nice. It's festive. See you next time.